you. Uh, yeah, so my name is Renzo Khalidi. Um, I'm part of the Android networking team, the core team, which does link layer independent stuff. There's Wi-Fi, there's telephony, and there's us. Um, so um, a little bit of what I'll be talking about, um, how a mobile device is sort of has different needs than a lot of other Linux networking stack users. Um, then what we, you know, how what we built around the Linux networking stack to do what users expect the phone to do, and what's upstream, what's not upstream, and what we might do after that. So, you know, one of the things that's different about mobile networking is that it, 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 it has needs that people might not sort of immediately understand are different from a lot of other users like data centers or home machines or whatever. Um, the phone is very different from a data center. Um, I mean, we, we do both at Google, so we <laughs> kind of know. Um, but so, you know, phone moves all the time. It's connected to networks that have varying quality. It's connected to multiple networks at the same time pretty much all the time. Um, it connects to different link types. Uh, it's got to deal with bad networks, low quality signals, fading signals, um, you know, captive portals, disconnected networks that don't go anywhere, but you need to use them anyway to connect to your wireless printer. Um, it's got lots of power issues. It's got limited bandwidth sometimes. It has to be metered. Um, it's got a sandbox model between different applications. You have to have per application routing. Um, it has very different problem set, uh, very different challenges from, say, a machine sitting in a data center. Um, it doesn't have as much performance and scalability work as, say, a machine in a data center, so um, that makes it a little bit easier on us. It's also fairly slow. Um, you know, the, the chips we have are fairly slow. They get into thermal throttling very easy. It's this very different uh, networking environment. And the main challenge, I think, um, it, it's, it's a very fundamental challenge, is that it's, it's, the phone is connected to multiple networks pretty much all the time. So if you've got um, a phone that's on Wi-Fi, you'll have, probably you'll have at least two networks up. You'll have an IP network that goes to the carrier's core network for IMS and voice signaling and SMS and things like that. And then you'll have, you know, you, you'll have Wi-Fi up and you might have mobile data up if some app is requesting it. If you're on Wi-Fi and you want to send an MS, you have to bring up the cell network, which is a different IP interface that's still on the cell network, but it's a different interface. And so all these things are up at the same time. They come and go. You need to do seamless switching because you know, when you get home, you want to be able to get onto your Wi-Fi network very quickly. And you want to leave TCP connections that were established on, let's say, the cell network. You want to leave them up until, you know, for a few seconds until you actually establish everything on the new network. And you have to tell the apps that the network has changed. And then what you actually end up having to do is you have to shoot all their TCP connections so that they don't get blocked on reads that will never complete. Because if you take away their IP address, and <clears throat> normally in Linux, it's just the, the TCP connection just sits there hoping that the IP address might come back. You know? And usually it doesn't come back quickly enough for that to make sense. So what we do is every, every network switch we close TCP connections. Um, we have to deal with IPv6. That actually complicates the architecture in a few ways, uh, as we'll see. Uh, but you know, this, it's just not an option not to you know, not an option not to have it as a first-class citizen. If you look at Android usage in the U.S. cell networks, the majority of it is actually IPv6 today. It's, it's more than it's more than 50 percent. Okay, um, it's got lots of power challenges. You know, power is a fascinating subject, very challenging topic that we won't necessarily go into here. Uh, but it, it does do things like when you have a kernel timer that doesn't take a wake lock, um, the timer might fire after one second after five minutes have passed. So it, it, it also, it's, it's actually quite interesting when you have that sort of event. Um, and we have to run the, um, the, the kernels that we run are not the newest, and that's um, mostly up to the OEMs and system uh, and SOC vendors. Um, but you know, the, the Nexus 5 runs 3.4. And uh, the Nexus 7 first generation used to run 3.1. And so uh, we have to run on a variety of different kernel versions. Every device has its own kernel tree. It's sort of uh, quite challenging even to know that you have the right commits in your trees. Um, also, you have to do stuff that users expect the, thing to be able to, the phone to be able to do. And it's not something the desktop class machine will do. It needs to be connected. That when you're on cell data and you're getting you know, email syncing and uh, chat messages coming in and you connect to a captive portal Wi-Fi, users don't 
you want the network to stop working, as we sit on the captive portal of Wi-Fi waiting for login, what we do is we bring up the Wi-Fi network in the background, we do a, a, a validation check, we see if it has a captive portal, and if so, we give you the ability to log in, right? That means that you have to have like robust first class support for, you know, connecting on multiple networks. And when that when you're using the weak host model, that really doesn't work well. So we have to build a bunch of infrastructure around the weak host model to make this stuff work. Um, other things, yeah, when you, people want to connect to their wireless printers or wireless cameras, a GoPro camera, um, you'd like to be able to access the internet at the same time as you do this. So you have to have different per application routing or per socket routing and so on. Um, <clears throat> and applications we want to be able to select this, you know, and the, the, the MS, MMS app needs to be able to bring up the cell network and bind to that network. Um, then we have data usage tracking, which, you know, is you know, fairly complicated as we'll see later on. Uh, per user VPNs, things like that. Um, here's one simple thing that we, you know, that since you know 6.0 we do. If you connect to a wireless network that's disconnected, so you connect to a wireless AP that doesn't have internet backhaul, or you connect to a wireless printer, uh, the device will ask you, do you want to connect to this network? Because it doesn't go anywhere. And in order to do this, you have to have the ability to at least you know, do DNS on the background network, to you know, open a TCP connection on the background network. When you switch to that network, the TCP connections that were established on it need to stay on it. The old ones need to be torn down and so on. So this is, it looks very simple, but you know, it has to have solid infrastructure behind it. So <clears throat> what do we do? So a lot, of, a lot of the complexity that we have is actually emulating the strong host model um, within the Linux networking stack, particularly IPv6 is, is solidly based on the weak host model. Um, the, um, and uh, the RFC 6724, so source address and destination address selection, um, basically are implemented in terms of the weak host model. Um, so you can't use the T-Mobile or whatever, you know, that you can't use your cell network IP address on Wi-Fi. It doesn't work. You can't use the DNS servers on Wi-Fi. It doesn't work. So there are a few things that you say, okay, well, how do you fix this? Well, just use bind and use source address routing. Well, it turns out that you can't actually do that because the application doesn't know which of the three or four addresses on each interface to bind to. And uh, with, with autoconf, with IPv6 autoconf, IP addresses can appear at any time, so you have lots of races in, um, in terms of, okay, so an IP address is, um, you, you call connect and that does a routing lookup and chooses your source address and then a new address appears. Um, so basically which source address to use depends on the DNS lookup. And so you have to do a DNS lookup, figure out the destination address. Based on the destination addresses, do a bunch of routing lookups to figure out the source address that you want to use. And putting that in the app is, is sort of unfair. You know, it, it's, uh, you know, not, it's complicated and, and doesn't seem to be the right thing to burden apps with. You can't use SO bind a device because a network might have more than one interface. We have this 464x lat thing which uses two interfaces, one on top of each other, to do IP4 to IP6 translation. Uh, you can't use IP tables if you care about your source address because IP tables gets to touch the packet way, way, way after the source address has been selected. And basically your only option at that point is to force rewrite the source address, which basically means local NAT. You've got the wrong MTU, you've got the wrong MSS, and so on and so forth. Um, in namespaces at the time we looked at this, it was, you know, they're very limited in terms of what we could do with them. Um, you know, an inter a physical interface could only be in one namespace. Uh, so that was, I, I don't know if the situation has, has gotten better, but um, again, you know, the kernels that we run are, uh, can be fairly, um, quite a lot behind the upstream. Um, so what do we do? We ended up using multiple routing tables, fairly sophisticated set of IP rules uh, with, um, with, we use a socket mark extensive, socket marked extensively. Uh, the application visible concept is this thing called the network. It's a, it's a Java API, and there's a corresponding NDK API as well. It's loosely equivalent to the ITF provisioning domain, which is essentially a, a set of interfaces or a set of network resources that are in one, that, you know, roll up to one administrative domain, one master. So, you know, your Wi-Fi would be one, and your, uh, your cell network would be another, but if you know the Wi-Fi network and the cell network were provided by the same carrier, you would try to put those in the same provisioning domain. It's, it's not something we support today, but it's it's loosely equivalent to a network. In many cases, it's an interface, but it's not not quite. 
not, not always. We bind connections to networks. Um, so for example, when you, when you establish a connection on, on, on your mobile network interface, that TCP connection is running. Cool, you only have one network. Now Wi-Fi comes up. The default route, in a normal system, the default route would switch to Wi-Fi, and that cell connection is dead in the water. It's sending out packets on Wi-Fi with a cell network source address. It doesn't work. So what we do is when, uh, when an app uses the networking APIs or when, um, when it calls connect, we set a socket mark in its socket that binds it to that network. So it's bound to that network for the lifetime of the connection. Um, we do other things for you know, incoming connections as well and uh, APIs. Then we have uh, each app on Android is its own user ID. So we have, well, we, what we do is we have in kernel support for per UID routing, um, which mostly works. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, so we have one routing table per interface. Uh, a lot of this complexity, by the way, is, is due to the interaction with, of the strong host model, and particularly IPv6 auto configuration, where addresses can show up basically at any time. And so we don't do autoconf in user space. We do it in kernel space. And so we can't afford to have any sort of rule that's based on IP address because it's pretty much out of date as soon as we add it. Because some other, other you know, you, you get an RTM new adder and, you know, when the address happens. But if, if someone's called connect in the meantime, the source address might be wrong. So we basically uh, put different, you know, um, put routes for a particular interface in a routing table that's particular to that interface. Uh, a network is one or more interfaces, and the, the sort of the main routing table is pretty much empty, uh, usually. It, it's, it's used for recursive look, root lookups inside the kernel when you do IP root default via blah, and then the kernel has to do the lookup for blah. And so we'll see later in the rules that's only allowed for root. Uh, basically, but the nice thing is that we don't have to worry about IP addresses at all. So um, an IP rule will select a network. Um, if you match an IP rule, that rule will look up a particular routing table and it will point to a particular interface which is in a particular network. If you, now if you want to change the default network, you change the default rule. Easy. Done. Um, we support the rules select for marks, which is you know, the implicit marks which are established on Connect, the APIs set the marks. And they also use, we make, you know, SO binder device or IP packet info socket options, we make those select particular networks and so on. Um, so because SO mark requires CapNet admin, we, when an app calls Connect or uses the socket APIs, we send the FD off to a privileged process so that it can be stamped and then we return it. Um, because Connect is going to be hitting the network anyway, it's not necessarily a very big latency hit. So we have C library shims for Connect that just proxy this, the FD over to a, to, to net, to user space daemon privilege called NetD, which has kept net admin, and so on. Uh, for incoming connections, we have some kernel, a little bit of kernel uh, magic that applies the, sta the, the, um, the uh, SKB mark to SK mark. Um, and marks contain the network ID and some permissions. So this is what, I don't know if you can read any of this at all, um, but this is what the rules look like. You can see that there are a lot of them. Um, some of them select for um, traffic that's where you've selected an interface by SO binder device or IP packet info or things like that. Most of them select for marks. There's difference between implicit marks and explicit marks. Um, then there's some permission bits and protect bits. The nice thing, again, is that there are no IP addresses in here. There's no, there's no source-based routing. There's all, the, all these tables. Actually, one simplifying assumption is that most networks that Android connects to basically has a default route. And so we, it, the system is mostly optimized for that. It doesn't do complicated routing. It, it basically assumes that you're, you're connecting to an internet access network. Um, but so this is fairly complicated. We, we have to build a lot of infrastructure just to do something that our strong host model basically would do for us. Uh, so we have these, all these routing rules. We have to shim the sockets through the NetD. Um, and so um, there's also new fundamental limitations in this approach, which aren't really necessarily a big deal in normal usage, but they are sort of things that 
there are problems. For example, like the socket mark in a network is decided before the routing lookup. So it's not always correct. You pick a socket mark, and that's basically the network that you're deciding to try to connect on. But if then you match, you know, if you're actually connecting to the loopback address, your the routing table that you actually hit is the local table, which is at the top of the um, at, at the top of the list of rules. So that what that means is that you can't look at a socket mark and figure out what connection or what interface that connect, that um, that connection is actually going out on. It's not easy, really. It's not really possible to support multiple networks on the same interface using this bubble. It's just too much. There's, we need a lot more help from the kernel for that. We need to tag IP addresses and routes with a particular network ID. So the ITF is, is working on the API for this. They've, they've defined an architecture which is really quite good. It's the multiple versioning domain architecture, RFC 7556. What we do is pretty much based on that. And uh, Eric, actually my colleague, is, is working in, in the, in the MIF, ITF MIF working group to figure out what a, an API for selecting network should look like. And once that's done, we might sort of try to implement it Linux and upstream it. We um, do not want to try to implement major pieces of functionality without an RFC behind us because it, uh, it, might, it sort of can lead to controversy. Um, so uh, what do we do? What does the stack rely on in the kernel? Um, so some of this stuff is upstream. Uh, for example, you know, um, we mostly use socket marks all the time. So everything that the kernel regenerates has a mark of zero. So what do, how do we deal with that? Well, fortunately, most of the time that the kernel does something, it's either interface specific, like IPv6 neighbor discovery, or it's a reply to a different packet. And when it's a re reply to a different packet, you just use the same mark as the original packet. And so you can use IP tables to mark stuff that comes in, and then the kernel will just reflect that mark, and so it will go out on the same network. And we, there, there's a Cisco that we, uh, that we added that was upstream for that. Um, incoming connections need to be bound to the right network based on where the SYN packet arrived, because an application just wants to listen to colon colon. It doesn't want to listen to colon colon on a particular network. Um, so the accept this call will write the SKB mark into the socket mark. Um, with these are upstream since 3.15. Uh, a few things with IPv6. Uh, maybe one of the major issues here is that the kernel is perfectly happy to use, you know, let's say your mobile data IPv6 address on Wi-Fi uh, if the Wi-Fi address happens to be tentative. And so during duplicate address detection or if the, y or if the IPv6 configuration on Wi-Fi is incomplete, it has a default route but no address, it'll do the wrong thing and it'll get stuck. Particularly if you have a DNS server on Wi-Fi, you'll get terrible performance because the DNS resolver is, falls back after five seconds and so on. So we, we have these simple syscadals that are tweaks. Uh, the VPN uses uh, UID-based routing. That's not upstream. It's actually fairly simple. Uh, it's, it's basically you call SOC, you know, SOC UI, UID in a bunch of places it mostly works. It falls over exactly where the XT owner module falls over, which is when the socket is orphaned and has no user space socket attached to it, you can't find out which UID it was. So if you're sending a fin for something that's sent to close, for, for a socket that's been closed, or if you're sending a reset for a socket that's closed, it's incorrect. Um, that's sort of relatively easy. You could just write back the market. You could write back the UID into the, into the protocol socket from the UID in the user space socket. That's not hard to solve. We don't solve that. Um, we're not quite sure what to do with this. We could, attempt to, we could attempt to upstream it again, given that we've been using it. You know, it's been quite useful you know, for a couple of years. Um, one way to do this alternatively would be to have a bigger socket mark so we could stuff the UID into the socket mark. Our UIDs are big for historical reasons. They're in 100,000 user blocks, so not even aligned on power of two boundaries, it turns out. Uh, but um, we, <clears throat> we could try it again, or we could try to, uh, I don't know, we could have a 64-bit socket mark where only the bottom 32 bits make it into the SK buff. Um, we're not sure what to do with this. You know, feedback welcome if you have a bright idea. But we do need to have different routing tables on a per app basis. It's just a hard requirement. We, we can't not do that. Um, so um, here's another one that did make it upstream recently. Uh, we had this evil SIOC kill adder IO control since, I don't know, 2009, which scans the TCP hash tables and closes all connections using TCP done. It was full of races. 
uh, it you know it, every time Eric changed the uh, you know, changed the TCP socket structure, it would crash because you know they, we couldn't find you know I forget what it is that we look oh we yeah we, we call stuff that's not in a listen socket or it's not in a time weight socket it would fall over um, and it's also not very flexible so we recently upstream sock destroy and you know we can now kill individual sockets which is actually quite useful to do stuff like um, better connection closing. When a VPN comes up, you want the connections that are now dead in the water because everything is forced through the VPN. You want those connections to stop working, to be closed so that the app can reestablish them. And so things like mobile data always on also when you want to keep mobile data up in the background but not actually use it so that you don't want the user to spend money, uh, then you can close those TCP connections and give apps that are unprivileged no access to the cell network interface. right? And then you can actually keep the mobile data connection always on. Um, they do usage accounting. This is an area that's uh, particularly far behind upstream. Um, one of the challenges here is that it tracks, it tracks bytes for every combination of UID, which is an app, and network interface. And so it's fairly expensive to do that in terms of IP tables rules. And IP tables is quite hard for us to use for reasons I'll get to later. But um, so what we do is we have this XTQ tag UID module which implements 64-bit socket tags. And it's kind of this bolt-on thing which uh, replaces the implementation of the um, owner socket exists IP tables module. So it's literally a drop and replacement. But it does log all these things and it, uh, it publishes stats in PROC. And we depend on that to do data usage accounting. Because when users go and go to the mobile network settings and say, okay, which of my apps use data? Well, that's where it comes from. So. Um, uh, so we, yeah, I think uh, this was before, so I'm not aware of all the state, this is before our time, but uh, a discussion about upstreaming this a few years ago didn't really reach a conclusion. Uh, the rate limiting, sorry, the, the bandwidth limiting relies of XT Quota 2 module. It uses an ent filter NF log socket for notifications, which is deprecated. It's just actually removed in 3.18, which we're, <laughs> so we'll have to figure something out there, um, and so on. Uh, so by the way, the versions that, that are in use at the moment are uh, Nexus 6P and Nexus 5X use um, 3.10 still. And uh, the, uh, the Pixel C uses 3.18. So it's, it's a slightly newer, but um, it's, it's fairly ancient versions from the perspective of this crowd. Uh, and of course, we everything that we upstream, we backport it and we have unit tests for it and so on because we have you know, 20 different branches and so we have we have we rely on unit tests to tell us what's in there or not. Okay, so <clears throat> ongoing challenges. Well, we have to. This is pro a problem of our own making, of course. You know, there's lots of backporting. Now, the, the real problem here is that the, the that the kernel versions that are used for a particular SOC are really determined by the SOC vendor when that SOC ships, and it does not get updated. And um, I don't know why this is, uh, and it, it is sort of, um, there is something that can be done to bring them a little bit more closely to reality, but the support, mo the to, to, to actual new kernels, but the support model for these is, is as I understand it, um, there is a distinction between pre-sales support and post-sales support, and uh, you know, it's sort of the, the, the SOC vendor business model, and, and they are not necessarily other OEMs as well. You know, if you look at the Android ecosystem, they're not as um, sort of excited about, let's, let's say, like Google and Nexus devices about upgrading software in the fields. There's not so much of that. You know, it's not a, you know, uh, it's not necessarily very appreciated by OEMs and SOC vendors. So um, that's an ongoing challenge. We're going to try to make some headway. We do try to backport everything, so eventually we won't have to carry these out of tree patches. Um, IP tables rules. So IP tables is a is a is a funny thing, right? We 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 basically fork an exec IP tables. That's our API, because there's no real kernel API. It's it's sort of very. There's warnings all over the place. Do not use this. This is not an API. Use libipt instead. Well, we can't link to libipt because we're Apache licensed, and libipt is GPL. So it's not like we're trying to do something proprietary. It's just that the licenses aren't compatible. So we basically fork an exec, and. Because IP tables grabs the lock, looks at all the rule bases, rule databases, which can be quite long on Android. It takes all the rules, then it twiddles the bits in memory, and it writes them back. 
it takes you know 30 to 50 milliseconds and we have all these things where when the user turns off background data we have to update all the rules and so we sit there for I don't know a few seconds doing fork and exec of IP tables in a loop and that's how it's done and on boot too we have you know a couple of seconds we just sit there IP tables rules you know so uh, we can sort of do something about that move to IP tables restore but you know and eventually we can my understanding is that NF tables is uh, better, faster to update, but of course when you're running 3.10, NF tables in the, is in the future for you. So, um, but any in general, anything that doesn't have a kernel API and a GPL only user space API is hard for us to use because of the licensing issues. Um, what we're looking for, what we're looking at now, and this um, is sadly not good news for this crowd still, is that we. Because of the power issues, when you wake up the main CPU, you're spending 250 milliseconds for 200, for 200, uh, sorry, 250 milliamps for 200 milliseconds. It's very expensive. And so even if you're basically, all you do is you turn around and you, you fire up the CPU and you, and you drop the packet, you've spent whatever, 0 0.014 milliamp hours. And so if the network you're on likes to send you IPv6 router advertisements every three seconds, you're toast, right? Your battery will last a few hours. And so um, what we're doing is we're basically going to push these filters down into the hardware, but we can't really use the kernel APIs that I know are being discussed now because we're so far behind upstream. So what we're doing is we're going to use the, the chipset HALs to push these filters down. We defined our own filtering language because BPF instructions are so big, eight bytes. Um, the the, the Wi-Fi chipset has 2K of memory that we can use. And so, you know, it's sort of not necessarily, certainly not what you would use to build a Linux switch on. So, um, also there's some keep alive offloading. We'd like to do TCP keep alives. Not sure how to do that yet. I think TCP repair might do what we want because we need the sequence number to generate a TCP packet. But I haven't looked at that yet. Um, so that was, yeah, that was, pretty much uh, what I had, you know, happy to take questions here, happy to take questions anywhere. Find me, I'm in a red sort of red Android uh, jacket. And <laughs> feedback welcome. Okay, does anyone have any question? Yeah. As far as this wait, 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 wait. Take the mic. Yeah, we are recording so far. As far as many of these APIs, including that filtering API is concerned, and we can talk about it tomorrow also, um, do, is there any, any reason to go with kind of what you said, a proprietary um, interface, rather than designing an upstream interface and then, up, and then backporting that in some way, even if that means adding it as a proprietary interface? For instance, here you could say, hey, you know what? We can't use BPF on the chip, right? But we could use BPF to configure it and then have the driver or some middle air actually go and jit it into the hardware, right? Rather than jitting it into what we do now, we jit it into x86 or MIPS or whatever instructions, right? We could say, hey, we'll jit it into the hardware interpreter and make it smarter that way. Um, because then we avoid having all these, you know, here's a new API that Android's going to use and then Android's going to use it for two years and then it's going to go away because hey, we decided we need this other new cool feature, right? Well, I think, I think the reality is that given how far we are behind upstream, if we want to use any sort of major functionality that you guys are developing now, I mean, the, the cherry picks are, it's basically impossible to use it in the field. Because... Uh, well, no, I, I agree. I mean, I'm not saying that you, you, we, should, um, we, we should get like, all the same APIs and we need to cherry pick the code and whatever, right? But I'm saying like, if we can at least converge as far as what the API is doing is concerned, then sure, we might backport that. And we as a vendor um, might have to backport that as some vendor API or something, right? That's specific. But then if we move forward, once, we're, once we start moving forward, we start moving this all into mainline, um, it should become some, some more generic API or it should become some more central API and not be a vendor specific API, right? But then if we kind of start standardizing on this API first, and then we just say, okay, no, let's see how we, how do we backport this? Okay, this might be ugly, right? Backporting it will not be trivial. We might backport it as a completely separate API, um, but at least as far as the semantics of it are concerned, we've kind of defined them upstream already, right? And the 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 contain the the semantics and what the, what we're transporting as far as the data, the filters in this case, whatever is concerned, right? 
I mean, my, to be honest, my, my hope is that this community will come up with an API that we'll be able to use in three years and we'll just throw away what we have at the moment. Um, that's, that's really um, part of it. Part of the challenge here is that we, like, um, until it's something that's well understood and standard, uh, we are actually providing the filtering engine and asking the firmware manufacturers to run it. So we have some C code and say, don't, you know, just take the C code, don't touch it, run it on your firmware, audit it, you know, run it. And it, it also the code is very far away. The code, that, the code for the hardware abstraction layers is very far away from the kernel. It's all sorts of code management concerns. It, it's not, uh, but, but my hope is like when, when this thing is actually part of mainline, we will actually switch to use but, it. But that's, that's the thing, right? It's not, never going to be part of mainline if, you're, if no one's pushing it, right? So, you know, if we, we, we as a vendor, we would say, hey, you know, now we have to add this engine to our chip to support Google. But in some ways, it might actually be a lot easier if Google were, if, if the Android user space were to give us a BPF program and we would say, hey, well, you know, we don't have to run your filtering engine. We can take this BPF program and JIT it, compile it, optimize it for our device as a small, with a small JIT interpreter like the x86 JIT. I mean, our chip isn't running x86, obviously, but you know, it's, you're running some CPU. So we could take BPF, validate it, um, JIT it into our native code or even, you know, um, some some engine code and then I think, put uh, it into the device. And that would give a, get us to a point where, okay, so now we've got all the APIs. It's already standard, right? It's the standard BPF API that we have upstream. We just have to tie it to the right device and to the right filters. And then we, we don't come up with the whole new way of, hey, you know, if you've got this little filter engine blob that only runs on this filter engine that Google C code wrote, that someone at Google wrote, um, that you now have to run inside your chip and you, you've got your, your, you're much closer to actually having something that could go upstream, right? Because this is never going to go upstream that way, right? I mean, no one else is going to implement that if they're not for, forced to work on Android. Okay, so then, I mean, part of the, part of the issue is uh, this stuff runs on vendors that have very low margins. And so it, it has to be very accessible um, in terms of you know how much work it is to implement. So sure, but you could still give them the exact same filter engine that you were speaking about and say, hey, you know, I've also got this JIT that takes BPF and translates it into that filter engine. So if you're doing the lowest cost thing, well, we we have a BPF to to APF translator, of course. Right. Can, so if you if you take that and you stick it into the kernel and you say, hey, you know, you we have. I mean, I don't know how big it is, whatever, <laughs> right? But it's not going to be a massive amount of code. Mm. So um, if you take all maybe of these pieces. Maybe let's not monopolize. If there are any other questions, maybe you should take this one offline. Yeah, we probably should. Yeah. Or we can. Yeah, we can, we can, we can find me. I think you're going, you going to be in cycles. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But um, good. So um, any other question? You said something about IPv6 DAD and how that collides with default route selection. Can you elaborate? I mean, I don't see the connection. Is it because you're using source-based address route selection or something? Um, I wouldn't say there's a conflict. I think the, the architecture is very much shaped. One of the things that shapes the architecture is the fact that IPv6 is important and it has multiple addresses and it uses the weak host model, and the addresses can change at any time. Those what, are. What does that have to do with that? Sorry. What does dad have to do with that? I mean, dad is just saying I have a unique address on this. Oh, line. dad, like duplicate address detection. Yes. Oh, easy. When when you're doing dad, your address is tentative, and it's deep preferred with respect to everything. So a vanilla stack will use the address on the wrong interface over the address that you're using dad for. So this is why we up, upstream the. I forget where it is. So dad is bad for you. Huh? That is bad for you, basically. No, you just have to embrace it and use it properly. You just have to make sure that when it's doing DAD, you'll, you won't use the address on the wrong interface. Now, RFC 6724 was written, RFC 6724 actually recommends the strong host model. RFC, but the kernel implementation of 6724 uses. I'm trying to understand, right? You're saying that default route would be selected based on a non tentative address, and that's the problem. The default route is selected using the routing table. And then source address selection runs, and it doesn't 
One of the parameters where you choose the source address is which interface you're going to send out the packet. It's not the highest priority parameter. So if there are other things like, oh, this address is tentative, I can't use it, that wins. The other question was, you said bind to device is not acceptable by packet info is fine? Um, you can't use so bind to device because the network might have more than one interface. But packet info is okay, so I can no, 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 bypass Look, we, no, 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 no. packet info. You can't <laughs> use so bind a device as your main mechanism. Uh, you don't, we didn't want to buy, we didn't want to strongly tie one-to-one -one interfaces and networks because you might want to have a network that's two-headed, for example, when you have a carrier network that also does carrier Wi-Fi and you have the same IP address. But we do, if you do use so bind a device, if you're root, which you're not on Android usually, it does work because we have rules that select the OIF parameter in the flow lookup and they select the right network. Okay, um, I'm sorry, but we don't have more time for this talk. Tomorrow um, we have a full track for the uh, Linux wireless workshop where uh, people can join to discuss all these problems and fix them in a better way. So um, thank you. Thank you.